Anyway, welcome to speaker series. Uh, this obviously is a free event that uh, we make available for people to hear exciting speakers, authors, artists, etc. And tonight we're welcoming uh, Richard Tejeda from Save by Nature, which I'm really excited about. I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but I wanted to let everybody know two things. One is that we are recording tonight. Oh, and there's Nancy. Hi, Nancy. <laughs> we're recording tonight's um, uh, events and it will be archived on our website and Save by Nature's website as well as YouTube. So if you miss a portion of it or if you've got to leave early or you didn't make it at all, uh, it'll be available for everybody uh, at some point in the next day or two. The other thing to realize is that uh, at the end we'll take some questions and uh, we encourage you to use the chat feature in the bottom portion of your screen to pose your questions. You can do that at, at any time and when we're ready to take questions at the, uh, at the end, we will uh, hopefully have sorted through those a little bit and we'll, we'll ask Richard as many questions as uh, we think we've got time for and the others we'll get to uh, after the fact. So Richard, uh, I have only known Richard for a couple of years and I only began to know him uh, uh, better uh, the past few months. But I met him a couple of years ago at a bio blitz um, along Coyote Creek, just below um, Anderson Reservoir. And uh, he gave an opening talk, introducing people to the activities of the day and the, the kind of the sacred nature of that creek and the area. And he told his personal story, which I found so moving. I knew right away that uh, this was gonna be a good friend uh, not only of mine, but of the chapters. So I'm, I'm so excited to have him here today. He's had a remarkable personal story. He, uh, well, let him tell that. I'm not gonna give anything away, but I will tell you one thing. During his presentation at uh, along Coyote Creek, he played a wooden flute before the event began, before everybody was sent out to uh, photograph and document the animals and plants along the creek. He played a wooden flute, a beautiful Native American uh, tune. And I realized that this man uh, isn't just knowledgeable about nature, he has a deep, deep personal connection, a deep passion for nature. And I thought right then that this is a guy I would really like to know better. So with that, oh, I should also say, uh, we have recently struck up a partnership with Save by Nature, and we plan on doing more activities in the future, not only presentations like this, but we're creating bilingual videos, We'll be working on bilingual uh, virtual tours and a number of other activities, including actual walks when COVID lifts and we're able to uh, get together again. But in the meantime, we're working sort of virtually with videos and virtual, pre, uh, virtual uh, field trips. In any case, I want to hand it off to Richard right away uh, so that you can hear him talk uh, for himself. And I'm going to hand over the controls. Let me see right now and um richard go ahead and take it away whenever you're ready well nice well thank you matthew for that uh beautiful introduction i'm excited to be here i um, want to give everybody a warm welcoming smile um i just uh this is only the second time that i've been able to share you know uh, with the public the origin story of Save by Nature, it's um, it's a very uh, you know private uh, story, and um, I'm just happy to be able to be able to open up to the public, um, and the hopes are are to be able to connect with people, um, and so I'll move into um, into this and ask that you uh, bear with me. It's uh, not always easy uh, to put yourself out on a limb uh, and tell some of your your personal story, and so anyhow. Now let's move right into super excited to see uh, everybody that is uh, joining us today. Let me share here. Okay, let's get this shit on the road. Folks, this is spring break for my kids, and they really don't want. Thank you. learn anything but you know we want to sort of stem that as well getting out Tay, you know what uh, Tay, you know what uh, let me pause this and 
back up. I think it got <laughs> caught up somewhere. Technology. Oh, let's prepare. There we go. All right. So, all right. Looks like we have some people in the waiting room. We got to move in. I think that might be my, my job now, huh? Just go up to I the think top. Since you me. own the uh, Admit video. Admit all. Yep. That's there it. Go. There we go. Great. All right. So, uh, Saved by Nature, there's Terry Trumbull. Okay, now I get to see everybody is coming in. Welcome, Terry. Welcome. Um, so, um, this is a photo, uh, and this photo is actually of Semper Viren Falls um, over at Big Basin Redwood State Park. It was actually uh, very passionate about the fires that recently uh, wiped out the historic structures, um, um, and many of you uh, may, may know about that. Actually, no, I have to stop sharing because I have to make sure that uh, the sound is on when I present. So give me one second. Sorry about that. And it is on. Great. Okay. So many of you know the fire. So anyhow, so one of the things that we do uh, here, we uh, partnered with California State Parks and Latino Outdoors, and we met over at Big Basin Redwood State Park, it being one of our first national and state parks having you know 2,000 to 3,000 year old redwoods, it's uh, definitely a life-changing experience to be able to come from the inner city uh, area and be brought into Big Basin and shown uh, this magnificent place. And so, um, love Semper Virens Falls and we were able to do that last year. It is an annual event, but unfortunately, um, you know, uh, we had uh, COVID uh, happen this year and so we were unable to uh, do that hike. And now with the fires, you know, um, it looks like it's going to be a second before we're able to get in there. But the hopes are that we're able to um, educate about the positive things of fires. Uh, we're we're uh, an organization that was uh, created for all. And our mission is to expose, teach, and enlighten people of all backgrounds and abilities through environmental education and working collaboratively with partners to ensure mental, physical, and spiritual healing. We strive to welcome the community organically to the natural wonders and recreational opportunities of the outdoors. And so uh, this right here uh, is a photo over at uh, Castle Rock State Park. Uh, and I believe that's a, a devil dog, if anything, but I could be wrong at the moment. Um, but anyways, uh, it's a beautiful uh, picture. We like to highlight uh, areas in the South Bay, but also in the Santa Cruz Mountains and beyond. So uh, most of the time uh, we're going to spend in this PowerPoint is kind of on this origin story. So again, for a long time, you know, it was hard for me to be able to open up about my story, being afraid of kind of being judged and things like that. And so what I was able to do is work with an intern and some of my board members to kind of write out a uh, sort of story uh, that I am able to share uh, with the public. And so I'm just going to spend, it's only about maybe a four minute read, but I'm just going to spend some time here because this is, uh, it's kind of uh, what people have asked uh, from, from me. And so, um, again, bear, me, bear with me, if you will. Um, so, so uh, where did Save by Nature originate? It began in my old neighborhood, intertwined within the adversities of my life. It began when someone like me who has been through what I have still makes it and has the heart big enough to help others circumvent the same roadblocks so they can live a wonderful, successful life. I won't tell you my entire story here today, but I will give you a glimpse into what events helped shape me into the person I am now and how nature saved my life. It was my life journey that led to the creation of Saved by Nature, beginning on the streets of South San Jose. My mother was 16 when she had my brother and 19 when I was born. She met my father who was from Texas, that's where I was born, while working in the fields of Gilroy. After I was born, my mother fled Texas from an abusive husband and my brother and I, uh, with my brother and I, she didn't have a chance to graduate high school, so we had very little money. We were on welfare. I remember admitting people at the same time. I, I remember, uh, excuse me, um, uh, that's my place, I'm so sorry. Uh, okay, I remember taking the bus a lot and eating government cheese, if you will. Growing up wasn't easy. I was surrounded by people who sold drugs. My neighbor was a crackhead, if you, if, um, excuse, you know, the blunt language. And my uncles who lived nearby were meth addicts. 
I soon fell victim of the streets and would lose many years of my life. When out in nature, however, I felt that I was in a whole new world, a place where I could escape my old neighborhood. What really hit me was the sort of trance I would enter, especially when uh, fishing and hiking along rivers and creeks. Must be the sound of the water that drowns out your negative thoughts. I wasn't thinking of my painful past. I wasn't really thinking of my future either. I was in the moment for once, and for me that's something that is rare because my mind is always running. I wanted to share this life-changing experience with others, but I didn't know how. <clears throat> I was uh, still finding my way. It wasn't until I enrolled in the West Valley College Park Management Program that I began thinking about creating an organization that would help people by introducing them to the outdoors. Eventually, I decided I wanted to be a full-time park interpreter to support my family, and because it felt safer, than starting my own nonprofit. While enrolled at West Valley, I landed my first job at Big Basin Redwood State Park as a park aide. I worked at the ranger station, checking in campers and selling wood. It was a wonderful experience with a long two hour commute. Wanting to work closer to home, I took on a part-time position with the nonprofit Guadalupe River Park Conservancy. I worked for two years as an education assistant Additionally, I was employed by the Santa, uh, by Santa Clara County Parks and Park Maintenance, cleaning bathrooms and disposing of trash, and with the Open Space Authority as their first seasonal interpreter leading nature hikes. My goal at this point was to become a park interpreter. To become a more competitive applicant, I enrolled in the Environmental Studies program at San Jose State. At the same time, I began an internship with Valley Water education and outreach department where I was promoted and worked for two years until my contract was complete. Throughout school and after graduating, I applied for various full-time positions to, as a park interpreter with local agencies. Each time I was denied, sometimes not even given a second interview. After nearly a decade of searching for an interpretive position, I felt that there were a few jobs for male Hispanic park interpreters especially given that I did not experience any in the field, which made it more discouraging. I realized that there were social issues involved and shifted my direction and focus on creating a place where people of color with 10 years of experience, passion, and two environmental degrees had a chance. Growing up in a low-income community, the schools I attended had limited resources. I was a first-generation college student raising a family. I couldn't afford the tuition of a UC, and I spoke only one language because my mother was suppressed from speaking Spanish when growing up. Because of my experience, when Save by Nature raises enough funds to hire staff, we'll use Avana, a toolkit to mitigate bias in recruiting and hiring. Becoming a full-time interpreter didn't happen for me for a reason. Each time I was told no, a log was removed and added to the fire that fueled my motivation to start Save by Nature. Why didn't they hire me? Because I was meant to be the founder and executive director of Save by Nature. I have an opportunity to leave a legacy behind and that is something for which I am willing to persevere. Being resilient while facing challenge is nothing new to me. I was set up for failure my entire life, yet I have succeeded. I'm going to make it, I'm going to make sure that others have the opportunities to succeed as well. I'm here to change lives through environmental education and justice, and I'm barely getting started. Thank you for listening. So, um, you know, Save by Nature is a very, very uh, new organization. We became a corporation on August 22nd, 2018. Uh, our kickoff event was held on April 14th, 2019, and we became a nonprofit on August, on August uh, 20th, uh, excuse me, 2019. And so we've actually uh, only been functioning or programming since April 14th of 2019. So um, we have a wonderful board of directors and I like to say that our board of directors um, you know, emulates you know, the community that we serve. And so uh, we have as president Terry Rogaway from Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, uh, who has also played a tremendous part in the uh, and the creation of Save by Nature, also in supporting um, me as the founder and executive director, uh, it takes a tremendous amount of resources uh, to be able to launch a nonprofit. Our vice president, um, Heidi McFarlane from the West Valley College Park Management Program, um, Annika Millen, who just retired uh, as the supervising park ranger from County Parks, and Andrea Fromm from, um, from Green Foothills, as well as uh, Shay Franco, 
uh, Emily Green and Marav Kabanchak uh, from the BioBlitz Club. And so we put together a, a team uh, that's very passionate about nature. We uh, had a different concept when choosing my board of directors. That is, uh, they were chosen for their passion, not necessarily for their business degrees and ability to raise money. That is, because, that is a challenge, but um, we um, are very passionate about what we do and passion uh, supersedes all else. And they've been doing a tremendous job um, as uh, the board of directors and uh, look forward uh, to seeing more of the board um, in different types of capacity. Um, and so people ask me, you know, why, why is this important to me? And so um, again, I went to the West Valley College Park Management Program where I was able to study park maintenance, resource management, um, law enforcement, and being a park interpreter. But it was uh, really noticing that I wanted to make a difference in people's lives and the way that they connected to nature. I wasn't too interested in giving people tickets. I more was more interested on when they left the park, how they felt about uh, the resource, and helping them build an affinity for nature, but also being the one in the park uh, with that background and ability to kind of walk up to anybody uh, and be able to immediately um, engage them and have a conversation with them, whether uh, them being the, the, um, the mayor of San Jose or being from the east side of San Jose. Um, and so I, I take a lot of um, um, pride in being, being able to do that. So. Uh, we do not focus on creating opportunity for one ethnicity um, and so we provide opportunity regardless of your age, gender preference, physical capability, rap sheet, wealth, or ethnicity. And I, the reason why we do that is because when I grew up in South San Jose in Vicky's town, um, I was surrounded by and I had good friends that were Caucasian, Samoan, Black, Vietnamese, and Hispanic. So I'm a firm believer that uh, poverty doesn't discriminate on the color of your skin. So Save by Nature was created to provide nature uh, and to be a bridge to nature for everybody. And it is challenging um, to be able to uh, have such a wide umbrella, but, um, but we have a lot of experience and we're, we're doing a great job. So you might wonder, well, how do you do that? It's a, it's a big job. Well, it is a big job. And the way that we do it is, um, again, uh, I want people to know that uh, we were created for everybody. So we do provide opportunities for the general public. We, we do um, wonderful nature-led hikes. We're very known for our hikes. Uh, we provide opportunities for at promised youth, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit, and also senior citizens, uh, which I'm very passionate about because uh, it was created um, um, in honor of my grandmother uh, who passed away. Virtual nature experiences were created. Uh, we've been doing virtual nature experiences and since, since April of 2019, well before COVID hit. And we did them for people living with disabilities. That's living with MS and CP, um, maybe having severe autism and unable to go outdoors um, or having you know, traumatic neck in, or head injuries people that are in hospital beds or stuck at home, unable to get out into nature. Uh, we've been bringing nature to them uh, since we began. So simultaneously, when we can, if we can, we provide both um, uh, simultaneous virtual programs, which I'll get a, a little bit more into. And then when COVID hit, we became very popular, lifting up other organizations around us and helping them uh, come up, uh, you know, bringing them up to par so that they're able to provide virtual experiences for the public as well. Save by Nature um, is also known for lifting up other organizations around us uh, because our board has been doing this for so many years and I've been doing it for about a decade now. And so we really enjoy lifting up the community and not just making it about us. Um, yes, and so uh, we do provide environmental education and that is uh, the Boys and Girls Club Summer Science Project where we go, uh, actually I'll talk about that uh, a little bit more in the, in the uh, presentation, K through six uh, school uh, field trips and in-person in and virtual homeschool uh, opportunities. And so our naturalist led nature hikes for the general public, again, we're well known for our thematic hikes. We do hikes on uh, you know, open space uh, preserves, uh, California state parks and beaches, 
Santa Clara County Parks, and we're moving into the city of San Jose Regional Park so that I can activate inner city parks, especially uh, 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 Great Oaks Park, which is the, the park that was in my own neighborhood. Uh, a lot of these lands are post protected uh, properties. And again, on, on Sunday, April 14th, we had our kickoff event. Just want to share with you, this is an annual wildflower event that we do on Coyote Ridge and Coyote Valley to uh, make people aware of the beauty of Coyote Valley. Here I am um, doing a virtual a simultaneous hike, our kickoff event to, again, you know, to, we, we want people to know that we're not your normal organization. So our kickoff event, it was very important that our kickoff event was a simultaneous virtual nature experience for those living with disability. So we had the public there in person, and then here I am with the camera, and I'm talking to the people back at home, because I don't, because it's, it's important we don't separate people, you know? They're part of the community too, and they should be on the public hikes as well, not necessarily separated and having their own hike. And they really enjoy that. They enjoy being able to be part of the group and talk to the group. They enjoy seeing these beautiful wildflowers. Um, we enjoy uh, engaging uh, the youth uh, of Santa Clara County. There's Heidi McFarland um, talking. Terry Rogaway was uh, given a Founders Gratitude Award for all of the work that she's um, done with for Save by Nature. And um, and here's a photo of a wonderful family enjoying the beautiful wildflowers. And as you can see, we kicked off right with all different sorts of ethnicities and different uh, sorts of ages uh, from young uh, to old. Um, and so uh, here we are at the at Promise Youth. And, uh, so uh, back in the day, they used to be called at, uh, at Risk Youth. And I was an at risk youth growing up and um but was i an at promise youth so last year i believe there was a bill signed saying that we're not going to call the youth at, at risk youth anymore we're going to call them at promise youth because they do have a lot of promise so we do partner with uh youth alliance out of south county and one of the things that we do is we hire uh, a wildlife artist this one being edward rooks uh who i will i will come in uh, and I will tell a, a little bit more of my story, get a little bit more in depth because the staff asked me uh, to talk to these at Promise Youth uh, a little bit more in depth about my story so that they can relate, introduce them to Edward Rooks. Edward Rooks begins to teach them how to uh, sketch. We take them on a cultural and natural interpretive nature hike. This one was at Castle Rock State Park where they learned about uh, the Ohlone people. Uh, we stopped uh, over at the Tifoni where they learned about the geology and they learned to uh, sketch uh, from Edward. Uh, we're about cr creating life-changing experiences that uh, hopefully these youth will remember for the rest of their life. And if this is a picture that they couldn't take a mental shot of, then I really don't know what's gonna, uh, uh, you know, make them remember these uh, experiences. But anyhow, we do our best. Uh, and ultimately, you know, bringing these at promise youth who may be from broken families, maybe from homes that um, uh, have, um, you know, people that may be addicted to alcohol or drugs. A lot of the kids, and I remember that I just wanted to be a kid and they just want to be kids as well. So when we get, they get out there and they're amongst themselves, you'll see them uh, turn into these, you know, big kids, you know? And here they are just being big kids and, uh, and that's what they are. And, and so they, they're allowed to do that out in nature and, and be themselves without being worried about being judged. Uh, they got to run into a, a, gar a, a gardener snake. And here we are at the observation deck overlooking the Santa Cruz mountains. Um, I did wear my uh, state park uniform because I was working for state parks at the time. This was a save by nature event but to help the kids have a positive experience with somebody of the same ethnicity uh, in a uniform, I decided to wear uh, my, my, my uniform. So we, we do our best and we go just a little bit uh, beyond. And uh, here we are, uh, here I am, you know, stuffing my face with togos because my wife was gracious enough to fill up a backpack and backpack us in sandwiches so that we can all eat together and break bread at the end of the program, you know? Our ultimate goal is to build our confidence and skills in the outdoors and send, uh, build a sense of belonging. So um, our virtual nature experiences that we do for the, the, um, 
for people uh, with disability as well as well as COVID. Here's Edward again. I'd like to use Edward. Just so happens he's in the presentation. Uh, but here we are uh, at Guadalupe at Oak Grove Park uh, doing a woodpecker sketching event. Uh, we, we go on a hike. There's Mount Aminam in the back. Uh, we looked at some springtails in a, in a grinding hole and, uh, and looked at some beautiful views. We were uh, lucky enough to be um, highlighted in, on NBC News back in March, um, you know, being one of the first organizations uh, to lead virtual uh, programs. But also, uh, again, we uplifted up other organizations such as uh, Monterey Bay Salmon and Trout Project, Keep Coyote Creek Beautiful, and Santa Clara County um, Valley Open Space Authority. So here's a little bit about that. Hey, you know what, uh, folks, this is spring break for my kids, and they really don't want to learn anything, but, you know, we want to sort of stem that as well. Getting outside is often, often an option. As we take a look at some video, this is a ranger that I went with on a uh, nature walk last week. In fact, I joined about 50 other people. I know that's not according to what we're supposed to do, but it was virtual via Zoom. Uh, we joined a little frog, and we joined the hand... Well, that hand belongs to Richard Tejeda, who's a naturalist, and his nonprofit, SavedByNature.org, that's what at the top, that's where you go to find out about his nonprofit, and free of charge, Nature Walks. He continues with them today, tomorrow, and Thursday. We went out through the nature in Coyote Hills area. We saw deer, we saw birds, we learned about all the wildlife, and we joined in with kids and teachers, so it was a fun learning experience. Guys, as we come back here, I just want to urge folks to remember they can send me what they're doing to bring a little bit of normal to their lives, and that might mean bringing some nature into their lives, some learning, getting out with people without really being with people. We have so many things to do, and I also want to know about people how they're managing to well, clean the house and how they're managing to stay sane with all the family members there. That, that's just for my family. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a big one for a lot of families <laughs> right now, trying to stay sane and all of this. <laughs> all right, thanks, Mike. Well, you know what? Uh, one way to kind of ease the tension is maybe step outside because, Carrie, it has been beautiful out there the last few days. And uh, you know, get some fresh air yeah. and just you know, enjoy it. Yeah, I think I might just sit on the back porch and do that Zoom, that nature walk that Mike was talking about. Maybe I feel like I'm actually there. <laughs> That'll be really cool. And, and you will feel like you're actually there, you know? All right. So, uh, again, I like to say that great nonprofits step up during, you know, hard times up for the community. And so we, we stepped up and provided about 32 different um, virtual nature experiences in 90 days. Yes, 90 days. And so uh, the Summer Science Project is something I'm very proud of. I am uh, one of the first five members of the Southside Boys and Girls Club, which was originated out of the uh, Davis Junior High cafeteria where my mom was uh, the lunch lady at the time. Um, and uh, she let me know that, hey, there's the Boys and Girls Club just started here. And, um, you know, I was excited and I played a, a softball and basketball and football. But at about the age of 13, um, I made some very bad decisions and started hanging out with the wrong people. And the, the director of the Boys and Girls Club at the time, who is now the director of Silicon Valley, who I get to work with, um, pulled me aside at the young age and said, Richard, you know, you're going with going the wrong direction you're hanging out with the wrong people and if you don't change bad things are going to happen and so unfortunately i didn't listen and bad things happened but uh when i was 10 years old the boys and girls club took me to yosemite to san jose family camp and it was a life-changing experience it stayed with me until i was an adult and decided to take my family there at about the age of 25 when i decided that when nature um, decided to change my life and so one of the things I did because the Boys and Girls Club can no longer go to Yosemite due to unfortunate circumstances is I created the Summer Science Project where we have five different organizations go in one day of the week for the entire month of July, bringing nature into the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and that includes uh, Saved by Nature. There I am in the back being a knucklehead with the salmon. Uh, we taught them about, you know, uh, the salmon and trout of uh, San Francisco Bay um, and how, you know, things like that. Uh, here's uh, Terry Rogway at Open Space Authority, uh, who came in, you know, will come in on Tuesdays and teach him about open space and the importance of uh, wildlife. Um, Don Edwards this year uh, uh, over the uh, San Francisco Bay Wildlife Society, we did a virtual experience this year, of course, uh, and um, we did a, a virtual hike around um, Don Edwards, which was a beautiful experience. We're able to serve about 120 kids this year, virtually, and about five different clubs, so we're very proud of that.
uh, uh, Valley Water joins in and created uh, watershed maps and teach them about keeping uh, pollution out of the community and how it ends up in gutters and into our waterways. And on Fridays, we celebrate with uh, WERC uh, and bring in or virtually bring in um, birds uh, so the kids can experience that. Um, since we started, I've been very busy, very passionate about this and passionate about getting the word uh, uh, and about a new organization such as Save by Nature out to the community. We've held 77 events uh, since April of 2019, which is pretty unheard of. Uh, our event outreach is, uh, we've reached 2,000 people. Our naturalist led guided hikes, which are in person, we've uh, reached 1,148. Our virtual nature experiences, uh, which include uh, COVID and those living with disability, we've been able to reach 2,847 people and uh, our environmental education, such as field trips um, and homeschool and other things, I believe, 253 um, there. And so um, we are making a tremendous difference uh, in the community, uh, a tremendous impact um, kind of for everybody. And so one of the things, uh, again, people ask me is why cultural competent nature interpretation is important. And so we're created for uh, be, you know, to be a bridge to nature, but we're also, also we're created for social justice. So social and environmental justice, they go hand in hand. They really do. I have a degree in environmental uh, justice and I have a degree in park management. And when we, when I study, you know, we learn that these two are very, very uh, closely related. Um, and you might say, well, what are you talking about? Well, I didn't realize uh, that I grew up in a food desert and that there was two liquor stores and a 7-Eleven were the closest access to food to my house. I didn't realize that I grew up in the pathway of the airport. I didn't realize that I grew up about 100 yards from Highway 101. And I didn't realize that I grew up about a quarter mile from the railroad. So that's what I mean about environmental injustice. And so. Here we see that why it's important. Well, we have these words such as justice and allyship and disability. And I put disability in there because when we talk about um, uh, you know, environmental justice, we have to remember that there's people out there with disability. And, and we also have to remember that we've been dealing with COVID since March, it's now September. So we've been dealing with COVID for a little bit over six months. There's some people that have been dealing with isolation for 20, 30 years that have been isolated. So it's important that we understand that. Equity, inclusion, and privilege. Now, unconscious bias, and this is from uh, Arvana, uh, a group um, that is uh, about, you know, social justice and helping educate. Anyways, uh, unconscious bias is a word that I put at the bottom because to me, our unconscious bias is, you know, uh, ha is directly affected by how we were raised and how we have interacted with justice, allyship, disability, equity, inclusion, or how we might be privileged. Okay, but when we start to look at the, it in the deeper roots, um, and when I start to look at this more deeply, uh, there's an issue uh, that we have to uh, talk about really quick. And uh, the good news here is that between 88 to 95% of non-Hispanic whites are using our public lands. African Americans comprise only 1 to 1.2 percent of all visitors and Hispanic Latinos between 3.8 and 6.7 percent. Now this is uh, nationwide from the U.S. Uh, Forest Service and the National Park Service, and, but I wanted to test it statewide and so when I did a training for all of the California State Park interpreters about interpreting to diverse audiences from uh, Mexico to or uh, to Oregon, I wanted to test this. And so the first thing I did during my training is I broke all of the state park interpreters up into ethnicity. And guess what? We had the same exact uh, percentages here where about, um, we had about 50 interpreters, about 45 were Caucasian, about three were Hispanic. We had um, zero black, one uh, Asian, and I think one that half identified as um, Native American. And so then, uh, so then it was the same statistic type there. But here in the Bay Area, we're more of a melting pot. So I believe that our statistics are a little bit uh, better. So then when we look at that issue, it's important that, you know, we start to look at people's narratives and to, uh, because we have to understand that not everybody is the same. 
you know, I have a different narrative. I grew up in a, uh, in a poor community. And so my narrative is uh, much different than somebody else's narrative uh, that grew up in a, a privileged community that was able to go to um, a, a UC in sorts. Um, and so uh, the thing is that we have to connect and but to connect we have to understand people's narratives now i'm able to connect easily to people's narratives and a lot of different narratives that have such a diverse background and but honestly it takes a long time to be able to connect to people and understand people's narratives this is something i'll probably be working on for the next 20 years but it doesn't mean that you can't be an ally um, and then once we're able to understand people's narratives we're able to connect to them and then we're able to create cultural relevant programming and so this is something that is um, that uh, Save by Nature um, has taken on and something that in the future we'll be doing um, more uh, trainings on. And so um, as a new organization, we cannot stress enough uh, that as a that it takes a lot of resources to launch a nonprofit organization, especially a new one. And so we've started a, a membership where you, be, you can become a member. We have an individual and student membership level. Uh, you can set up a recurring donation, uh, whether it be uh, 10 or $15. I like to tell the story of the recurring $15 donation that uh, pays for our monthly Zoom uh, that allows us to do our virtual nature experience, but also doubles up and allows us to do our um, Zoom board meetings. And so something as small as a recurring $15 donation makes a huge impact. And then um, we have a corporate, corporate and nonprofit uh, sponsorship levels as well. And so uh, for me, it's uh, not just about connecting people to nature in the beginning, it, it, it really is. But then as you, you know, start to really look at things, it's about connecting nature to the people. And so and you might say, well, what's the, what do you mean by that? Well, this Saturday, for example, we're having Hispanic Heritage Celebration with Latino Outdoors and Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority, where we'll be visiting three different uh, historic preserves that were once, once um, ranchos owned by the Spanish and then owned by the Mexicans. And we'll be talking about those landowners and having people join us and uh, having uh, Hispanic people celebrate the fact that they're, they were once and are still connected uh, to our public lands. And uh, so um, here is uh, a Saved by Nature uh, mural. This is uh, a way, and I was told to explain this to people. It's a mural, it says Saved by Nature and it's a way for us to connect um, to different audiences. And so this was put together by my cousin, who's a graffiti artist. At one time, you'd get uh, in trouble for painting on fences, and now people uh, paint, uh, pay him to uh, draw murals on their businesses. And so uh, we find uh, different ways to, to connect to uh, communities, you know? And so, uh, um, if you're interested in supporting us, uh, you know, www.savebynature.org is where you can find out information, more information. We do have a program tomorrow at 12 p.m. Uh, with the Wildlife Education Rehabilitation Center in, in celebration of our partnership with um, Audubon, where they'll be bringing in uh, live raptors um, and presenting those uh, to us. I want to thank you for coming, and I also want to uh, throw out a special thank you. Uh, to Chris Cruz and Heidi McFarland from the West Valley College Park Management Program, Pat Ferraro from San Jose State University, uh, Terry Rogue uh, from Open Space Story, Elizabeth Hammock from California State Park, Shelton Johnson from National Park Service, and Jose Gonzalez from Latino Outdoors, who all have been an inspiration uh, in my life in, in many different ways. Uh, I want to remind everybody too that there's many nonprofit organizations in California, actually thousands. There's hundreds of nonprofit organizations um, in the Bay Area, but there is only a handful on one hand um, that are doing the inclusive work that we're doing and that we plan to do with Audubon. So we appreciate um, your support uh, and I uh, hope that you can uh, share our message uh, with others. There's actually somebody entering right now. Doug! Somebody just entered, I just admitted them. And uh, so yeah, so I, I guess I, I, give, I hand it over to you, uh, Matthew. We stop sharing. Great. See handsome Terry Trumbull. Uh, did you Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, Richard, uh, I, I want to tell you 
thank you for that presentation. It was incredibly inspiring. The work you're doing is like nothing else I've seen. And I'm so happy that you're, that we're part of your family now. Um, now, I, I think I've seen a few questions come through and I, I wonder if Barry, were you, were you able to kind of uh, identify some that we'd like to pose to Richard? Uh, yes, I, yes, I did. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Can't hear myself. So. <laughs> okay, uh, so there's a few questions, not very many, but I'll get through them. And uh, start with the first one. Uh, you talk about becoming a member and donating. Are there ways we can volunteer to help? Are there ways people can help your group? Absolutely. Be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so um, we have a wonderful intern right now, Robin Davis from the West Valley College Park Management Program. Uh, the volunteer opportunities we have are, um, are, are many. If you visit our website and go to volunteer, you can fill out an application form and it asks you, how do you want to volunteer? Do you want to help with virtual nature experiences with the Boys and Girls Club, with, um, with, with uh, public hikes, or it just asks you, you know, how you want to help out. So yes, uh, as a new organization, I can't uh, tell you enough how much uh, we can use uh, the help of volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for Certainly. asking. Cool. Uh, my wife, Ginger, says, you mentioned homeschooling. Uh, we homeschooled our kids all the way through high school. What are the things that you do to reach out to homeschoolers? How do you reach the homeschooling community? Well, so uh, right now, you know, I, I did teach for Ocean Grove for six years, and we are currently going through the process of being on the Ocean Grove um, list. Right now, we have a waiting list going for in-person or virtual nature experiences. And um, and I just can't say enough about the homeschooling. Again, I worked with them for six years and I, I, I personally noticed the difference between uh, leading uh, public field trips and, and working with homeschool children and the homeschool students are well-rounded in their understanding, not only of the earth, but of just studies in general. They're able to make better, more interesting connections and things. And so yeah. a big fan of, 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 the, um, of our, uh, homeschool program and we do uh, provide opportunity for autistic children as well meaning that uh, you know I'm, I'm um, trained to work with children that do have autism and a lot of times these children get turned away from uh, homeschooling opportunities and uh, mm -hmm. just so we, we don't we don't turn uh, uh, those that have special or that are on the spectrum away from our homeschooling programs just so people know that. That's thank great. you, Richard. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. That's, that's ginger. <laughs> I love how you include the people that can't make it physically on the walks with you at the same time. Live streaming the walks is a really great uh, technique, and I'd love to learn more from you, but I can talk after the meeting mm -hmm. about the technology that you're using uh, and any, any difficulties. I know there are parks that don't have cell signal, for example. Um, so I'd be curious to, to talk to you more about that, but we can do that offline at the Tech Talk. Sure. Uh, another question. Have you personally experienced an unwelcoming environment in local parks? If Absolutely. So, how do I don't, I don't talk about it too much. <laughs> Go ahead. Can you want to well, talk about it a little bit now? Or? You know, I don't want to talk too much about it. Okay. What, what do you think just we can do that. to fix that? Well, you know, being a person that, that has, you know, put on a state park uniform and I've walked in parks and walk with, uh, you know, myself being the only uh, Hispanic park interpreter for the whole district of Santa Cruz uh, and walking with a, a colleague and then walking by myself. And it's unfortunate the way that I, I have been treated in my state park uniform. Um, mm. And during when I welcome people, um, and so I would just say the advice out there is, you know, I know that you might not see a Hispanic male interpreter out there every day, but out of common courtesy, when somebody greets you or says hello, it's always a common courtesy to, to say the same back. And I've always thought it was yes. just me, but then I've walked with other colleagues and asked to test this theory out and it was not necessarily a theory the theory was confirmed and so yeah. um so but also um it's also why i'm there 
Um, and it's also part of the, of the humiliation and putting yourself out on a limb, uh, including, you know, being able to tell that story. And so uh, just know that um, uh, male Hispanic interpreters are very rare in the field. Yes. Thank you. And we want to work together to change this, to change this mentality, to change this behavior. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, the next question, I'm going to skip a question here just so I can read while you're talking, but uh, what is your geographic reach? How, where does Saved by Nature reach out to now? And related to that is, do you have ex plans to expand to neighboring areas or have satellite chapters? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I thank you for asking that because when we were uh, partnered with Virtual Photo Walks, we were kind of like international because they were an international organization. So when we started doing our virtual nature experiences, uh, people from Japan, Canada, uh, Russia, you know, uh, all over the world were tuning in. Um, and then, uh, but, you know, but now um, our virtual nature experiences are more, we get people throughout the United States, but the majority of our focus, because we can't stop people from joining, you know, from around the United States, which is great. But our focus is the South Bay and, and, and Santa Cruz. And uh, that's like, you know, where our focus is. But we un un unintentionally have reached uh, throughout the United States, like all 50 states. Wow, that's <laughs> and, amazing. Um, and, um, and, uh, and also uh, other other countries as well but but our heart in our in our you know mission and focus is here in the south bay um and in santa cruz of course of course um nancy westcott asks have you worked with people living with alzheimer's and other dementia in your virtual programs uh no no we haven't no no, no. okay um and then the last question do you give trainings or are you planning on giving training on how to be a supportive ally as an environmental educator? A absolutely, absolutely. And so, um, you know, working with uh, Peninsula Open Space Trust, working uh, with, uh, you know, uh, Mark Madreros, working with Audubon and Matthew Dodder, uh, you know, uh, I cannot say enough. And I don't, sometimes I'm really blunt. Uh, and sometimes it's hard to be, but the way that I put it in the California State Park training uh, um, amongst every, among everybody, and people, people appreciate it. It's hard for me to say, but people appreciate it. The ally is the most important thing, and the reason why is that because a lot of people of color are not in positions of power, and a lot of other people are so it's important for the people that are in positions of power power to be allies to lift organizations like save by nature uplift underserved communities of color so we do do a program it's kind of terry likes to call it our president terry really likes to say, it's interpreting to the interpreters on how to interpret to uh audiences you know of color or how to uh, be an ally so everybody, regardless of the color of your skin, can be an ally and uplift. And so that's important because sometimes people just feel like I can't make a difference because I'm Caucasian. I must be part of the problem. No, no. <laughs> Martin Luther King's best people were Caucasian mm -hmm. because they had the political power. So anyways, I don't want to get too much in it into this element of things but it's important to say i guess right people some people appreciate it and things and so um being an ally is important and so that's why i want to thank audubon uh, you know um because audubon's been around we've been around in a year and a half audubon's santa clara valley audubon's been around for 91 years we've been able to make a tremendous difference in a year and a half but um but organizations that have been established are able to uplift us Imagine where we'll be five years from now um, as, a, you know, working together to serve the community. We've served, uh, you know, 1,800 people in a year and a half, but five years from now, annually, 
we hope to serve between five to 10,000 people and then just keep increasing those numbers, you know, by, by partnering and allying uh, with organizations. And so we hope to, you know, bring that training out soon. It might be coming out sooner than we think as a webinar uh, that you can join. Oh. Um, and um, as part of a series uh, produced by myself and our board of directors, as part of a, a fundraiser where people might pay $25 to attend this webinar and learn how to become an ally um, and things like that. So, yeah. Excellent. Look forward to that. Mm -hmm. One last question, then I'll hand it back to Matthew for closing comments. Uh, have you done any work with people without housing? Uh, Mary Wisniewski asks, she says, I worked, I work with a group of women in the shelter program and they are so aware of supported by and truly saved by nature. People who spend all their time outdoors become good observers and create relationships with plants and animals that others overlook. We're currently in the process. We were um, we were contacted. A president was con uh, contacted by a homeless shelter who wants to provide programming, and so we're going to be doing that. Um, and so, as a new organization, our, our challenge is funding. So when we're approached by an organization like this, um, and we don't have sustainable funding, I step up um, and provide the opportunity regardless of if there's funding or not. And um, which is something that, um, you know, that we're currently working on uh, as our, our board of directors. And also um, uh, tomorrow is the, I guess, I have a lot to say, but I don't want to say, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. There's a lot I don't want to say that I'm going to say, all right? It's a special day, right? Oh, so right. tomorrow tomorrow is the announcements for the uh, Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority grants. We did rank number one. We did rank number one, our cultural competency project. It's called the Cultural Competency Project. We rank number one, and that is going to allow um, some funds to be uh, put to where I can be paid to provide to i've done the summer science project for free for two years for the boys and girls club and now i can get paid to do the summer science project i've been doing the youth uh, uh at promise youth project for free for two years and now i'm going to get paid to provide this experience and then the virtual nature experience for people living with disability i'll now be uh, compensated to provide these opportunities so it's been a rough challenging two years i'm not I come from a poor uh, background as it is, and to be able to launch a nonprofit uh, without funds, and you know, it's tremendously difficult. But um, we have um, people again, like Terry Rogway, who stepped up, and we're on the verge of uh, of becoming, a, you know, a, a, a nonprofit with a foundation that is going to just make a tremendous difference. So tomorrow, if you're interested in saying a little something about support you can you know you can uh register to be a speaker uh, request to speak and say a little something and then but we're also going as an organization to help some people that didn't make uh the funding we're sitting up here again we're uh, as a new organization and we can sit up there and we can say yay we did it but instead of doing that we're going to come back for those who didn't make the cut or who didn't get the funding and we're going to speak up for those and, and the importance of them getting funding as a nonprofit organization as well. And so it's just one of the good things that we do again about uplifting other organizations. Wow. Yes. So very <laughs> wow. exciting time. Really very, exciting. very exciting time. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Richard. Your origin story and the work you're doing is truly inspiring. And I've, I'm really excited about this partnership that we have with you now. And with that, I will hand it back to Matthew. And he can close us out. Yes. Thank you, Jerry. <laughs> uh, so, Richard, as I said before, your, your presentation, this is the second time I've seen your presentation, but it, it moved me the first time and it moved me even more this time. Your work is truly inspiring. It comes out of a, a deep personal passion for life and nature and, uh, you know, finding your way out of a bad situation. So, Congratulations to you and what you've achieved, your own personal success and the success of your organization. I can't think of an organization that is more worthy of the support. I'm so grateful that you're able to, willing to be our partners, and I look forward to working with you more uh, and us helping each other learn. 
And uh, I just, I'm, I'm so excited about what we're going to do together and what we're already beginning to do in the way of virtual solutions and videos and such. There's more good stuff to come from, from you, I'm sure. And uh, I just wanted to point out to everybody that there was a story about Save by Nature in the most recent uh, fall edition of the Abbaset Quarterly, which is available online. Uh, it's a two-page story. And then, of course, Richard ended up on the cover right here for tonight's conversation. As well, our most recent, uh, well, our first and only annual report, full-fledged annual report was published just recently. And Richard and Save by Nature are in here as well as one of our uh, incredible new partnerships. So there was one thing you mentioned that uh, I, I wanted to ask a question about, but uh, I don't know how to pose the question other than to comment. Y your remarks on the food desert seem incredibly important and the fact that you didn't really realize that you were in a food desert. You didn't really realize that you were in the direct uh, flight path of the airport, that you didn't really realize any of these things until you actually had a chance to step outside, uh, experience nature, and see what that difference brings with it. And because of that, you're making that vision possible for hundreds of other kids. Um, of all different backgrounds that also probably don't realize what their situations are, what their food desert is, what their bad neighborhood actually is, because they're living in it mm -hmm. and you don't see something when you're so close to it. You yes. have to step away before you can truly see it. So it is remarkable work, a remarkable progress, and uh, I just wanna thank you so much for doing what you're doing, everything you're doing, and everything you're teaching us. So thank you so much. Uh, I am so excited for you and the future of your organization. And I'm just gonna leave it at that. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. And, and uh, I always like to throw shout outs. Where I learned about, I grew up in a food desert. Where I learned about social injustice, the gentleman sitting in this uh, forum today, that's Terry Trumbull, who's taught the, uh, the um, gosh, what is it, Terry? Uh, it's the, uh, Environmental justice. What is what class is it? So anyhow, uh, Terry Shumble's class is where I learned environmental law, and it's where I learned about all of the injustices, and that I did indeed grow up in that area. So it's why I'm so passionate about getting people into Cowdy Valley, uh, is because once you enter Cowdy Valley, you enter a whole new spectrum of uh, fresh agriculture, fresh air, open space. And it's a whole new world. And so that's why I'm so passionate about Cowdery Valley and the Valley of Hope. Make sure to visit www.savebynature.org and register for tomorrow's program in celebration with Audubon. WERC, 12 p.m. It's a lunchtime treat. Live raptors and owls. Uh, you can't beat it. So thank you, everybody. And thank you again, Audubon, for uplifting uh, Save by Nature. And we look forward to continuing to do good work with you in the future. Great. So just a second. Everybody unmute, if you don't mind. Unmute, your, <laughs> unmute yourself. Let's send Richard out with a huge applause. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Very good. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Tool. Wonderful Thank experience. It's Thank good. You. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Cuídense awesome. mucho. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Gracias. Mm -hmm.